So Romans 9, I'm going to be reading the first five verses. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, when Jesus told us that apart from him we could do nothing, he, he meant it. And we know that apart from you, we are unable to understand your word aright, much less to orient ourselves correctly toward it by loving it and by obeying it. So I pray right now your spirit would do what none of us can do, that your spirit would open our minds to understand, that you would, would warm our hearts to love this truth, and that you would, would reorient our wills so that we come out of here different and that we are obedient to your word, and that we live lives that more thoroughly honor you and advance your cause in the world. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. How do you feel about unbelievers? I think as our society deteriorates, as things become more and more hostile to Christians, it is easier and easier to have negative attitudes toward those who are not in the faith, to feel toward them that they are the enemy, uh, to perhaps even feel anger and dislike toward the non-believers who may be around us. Um, on the other hand, historically, for a lot of Christians, unbelievers are simply a matter of indifference. It's just, oh, they're there, that's their problem, I'm just going to go on with my life. But when you look at the Apostle Paul in this passage, you see a very, very, very different attitude. And so looking at his example, the question would be, have you ever had trouble sleeping at night? because of your concern for the spiritual state of the people around you? See, Paul shows here that he has sorrow and anguish over the lostness of his fellow Jews. People who, as we will see and, and discuss through this message, are the very people who have opposed him the most rigorously. And this morning I want us to look at why he feels that way. We want to look at how this passage fits into the letter as a whole, how his passion is aroused by this, what it is that compels such passion on his part, and then we do the difficult work of applying it to ourselves and asking ourselves, what difference should that make in us? How should that motivate us? Now, we have to start by looking at the whole book of Romans. Now, I'm aware that you guys have been going through Romans for some time. I'm also aware that you have been not in Romans for the last few months. So, um, as Carlton said to me earlier, just like your favorite TV show, you know, you ended with a cliffhanger. And then you had to go the whole summer without seeing it. Well, now here, here's the recap. We're, we're going to sort of go back through it because you cannot understand this passage without understanding the whole book. In fact, it is a safe rule of biblical interpretation. I would say the first rule of biblical interpretation is what's the context? Things only mean what they mean in context. A word only means what it means in its sentence. And a sentence only means what it means in its paragraph. And a paragraph in its chapter and a chapter in its book and even the book in the Bible as a whole. So, although some feel that this section, Romans chapters 9 through 11, is a kind of parenthesis, sort of a bolt out of the blue that interrupts his argument, and some have said you could read smoothly from chapter 8, verse 39, right into chapter 12, verse 1, without missing a beat, uh, I think that is misunderstanding the book of Romans. This is not a temporary diversion from the flow of the book. See, Paul is weaving a very tight argument in Romans, and this is a necessary element in that argument. And to understand it, we need to remind ourselves of where he has come so far. Now, first of all, just ask yourself, what is the book of Romans? I would argue that the book of Romans is a missionary support letter. This is missionary literature. The point of all of this is that Paul is writing to Rome where he has never been on his way to Spain where no one has ever been with the gospel. And he is writing this to the Roman church to ask them to support him on his way. So literally it is a missionary support letter. And it's written to give them his understanding of the gospel and its implications because it was clear to Paul that they should not support him if they didn't know that. 
So this is in some ways a model for what you ought to be asking of every missionary candidate. But what do you understand of the gospel and how it plays itself out in your life? That is the basis on which, with integrity, you can support someone going out. Now, in this letter, he makes reference to the Old Testament literally from start to finish. Right at the very beginning, in the opening verses, he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, listen, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and then he goes on. So he's writing to this church, which is a mixed Jewish-Gentile church, but he is from the very beginning rooting what he's saying in God's work and relationship with his people, Israel. And then after his conventional greeting and thanksgiving, which follow the, the bare form of a normal letter in his day, but it actually are not conventional at all since he packs in meaning uh, and gospel content in them, he states his basic theme for the letter. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for our salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Having given the theme, which is the gospel itself, and it is a gospel of justification by faith, he then, without even, even taking a breath, goes straight into the problem that the gospel is there to solve. Because if you don't get the problem right, you won't understand the solution, and you certainly won't apply the solution correctly to yourself. And the problem is huge. The problem is stunning. He gives this expose of the condition of the human race, and that is a condition of violent rebellion against God. You know, so they, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but their foolish minds were darkened. There's a downward spiral that Paul describes in Romans 1 that sets the stage for everything else. And without it, you really literally don't understand anything in the Bible. He tells us that the knowledge of God is universally available through creation. That it is not possible to live in the world that God made and ignore the reality of the maker. Um, that it's not possible, but people do it. And that's the point he's making here. Because people who should know better fail to honor him as God or thank him for his goodness and graciousness toward them. Instead, they willfully suppress the truth. This is self-inflicted futility and folly that characterizes the entire human race. But when people suppress the truth about God, they don't generally become atheists. They become idolaters. In fact, even atheists are actually idolaters. They're just idolaters of themselves. That somebody is going to be God in your life. You've got to serve somebody, in the words of, of, of Bob Dylan. And that somebody becomes something other than the true God. It becomes some, some perversion of deity. So denial of God leads in every human being's life to idolatry. The worship of something other than the only one who deserves our worship. And idolatry leads inevitably to immorality and perversion. Uh, we, we see it all through the Old Testament. We see it in our own society today. Failure to honor God or give him thanks leads to perversion and immorality. And so some of the saddest words in the whole book are the words repeated twice, God gave them up. God said, okay, you want to go that way? Go that way. Worst thing that, that, that could ever be said to us by God. He gave them up to every form of sin. And so just as you keep reading through the passage you begin to realize just how wicked the human heart is and how horribly that manifests itself in human life. Furthermore, not only do people engage in sin, they approve and encourage others to sin, and that in turn leads to societal decay. That's the condition of the whole human race. And if you don't grasp that, you won't grasp the gospel at all. In fact, I think one of the roots of most theological error is a failure to properly appreciate, properly understand the doctrine of human depravity. If you don't get that right, everything else is gonna, gonna go sour. Now he then goes on to talk about the folly, therefore, of judging others when you yourself are a sinner. Uh, he says, you know, if you, if you condemn others for this, well, guess what? You're in the same boat that they are. 
He talks, in fact, about the folly of presuming on God's kindness, forbearance, and patience. He says, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. At this point, Paul sort of steps back a little bit and creates a general picture of the justice of God and the covenant of works. So he says there's two kind of people, potentially. There's two categories, two sets, those who do right and those who do wrong, those who are righteous and those who are not. He says obedience leads to life, glory, honor, and peace. Disobedience leads to wrath and fury. And so he creates a category a very a distinct possibility of those who are justified by their own works. And it is absolutely true. If you are absolutely perfectly conformed to the image of God in every thought, word, and attitude from the moment of conception to the moment of death, you will be saved by your works. It's there. It's there in Scripture. God is just in that way. He's soon going to demonstrate that, yeah, there's nobody in that category, but the category exists. He then turns and gives special attention to his fellow Jews and tells them that having the law is useless unless you obey the law. The circumcision becomes uncircumcision if you break the law. And he points out two issues that he's, he's raising that are going to have to be addressed, he's going to have to come back to. The first of those is what advantage have the Jews? He says in chapter 3, I mean, they have the oracles of God. What advantage has that been to them? And then the second issue is does the gospel he preach lead to license. Why not do evil that good may come? If you're, if you're saved entirely by grace through faith, then why not just go ahead and, and enjoy your sin as much as you want? Isn't that where it would logically lead? So he's going to come back to those two, but for the moment he wants to keep going in his exposition of the gospel. And so we'll come back to each issue later on in the letter. Paul then launches into a stunning summary of the human condition that makes the gospel necessary in chapter 3. He says, everyone, Jew and Gentile alike, is under sin, is a sinner. In fact, quoting from the Old Testament in every one of these, he says, no one is righteous, no one understands, no one seeks for God. Nobody's looking for God. Nobody is seeking after God. People are running away from God. All have turned aside. No one does good, not even one. By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in the sight of God. In other words, that theoretical set he created in chapter 2 of someone saved by their works, it exists, it's just an empty set. There's nobody in it. A good man in the jungles of Africa who has never heard the gospel will be saved by his works. The problem is that man does not exist. He's not there. Everyone on earth deserves condemnation for, from God on the basis of our rebellion against God. And, in other words, no Jew is going to be saved by being Jewish. No one has ever been saved by practicing any religion, even the one that God established. And this is going to be critically important to our understanding, Romans 9, verses 1 to 5. The Jews of Paul's day have a tremendous advantage. All that advantage does is underscore their guilt. Now, God could have stopped at that point and been totally just, okay? You made your bed, you lie in it. You've rebelled against me. You've totally messed up your own lives and the planet. Deal with it. But that's where mercy starts coming in. And the, the, the next two paragraphs in Romans 3 are the very heart of the gospel. It says, but now a righteousness of God has been revealed apart from works of the law. A righteousness that is a gift from God. God giving us a righteousness we don't have. And we receive it entirely through faith so that we are now justified by grace alone, not by our deserving, through faith in Jesus alone. And on the grounds of his dying in our place as a sacrifice that satisfied the wrath of God. It's the propitiation in his blood, even though that's a, a long and fancy word. It's, it's one of the most important words in the Bible because not only did he cover over our sin, he bore the wrath that we deserve. And apart from that, there is actually no gospel. And this justification by faith, apart from the works of the law, is equally available to Jews and Gentiles. Now he then goes on in the book to illustrate the principle of justification by faith through the story of Abraham. So once again, he's rooting his message in God's promises specifically to 
the father of Israel. Uh, he describes the consequences of our justification in terms of peace with God and the transformation of character. And he helps us understand it from yet another point of view by drawing the analogy between the imputation of Adam's sin and the imputation of Christ's righteousness. And this is another essential piece of the puzzle because we have to recognize that all of us were born not only corrupt but guilty because of the federal headship of Adam over the entire human race. All of us sinned in Adam. So, I mean, how many of you have lived around babies? Okay. Um, how many of you who have lived around babies ever doubted the doctrine of original sin? Um, my theology professor in seminary, a guy named Roger Nicole, once said that he said, I've known of theologians who deny original sin, but as far as I can tell, none of them are parents. Um, you don't have to teach your child to be a sinner. They're born that way. And, but just as in Adam, all of us are, are guilty sinners before God, so now in Christ, all of us who are in him are declared righteous before God. And, and he's showing you very clearly, you, you can't deny Adam and Eve, and you can't deny original sin and hold on to the gospel. They are absolutely uh, tightly combined with each other. They work the same way. It is through imputation that we are born sinners. It is through the imputation of Christ's righteousness that we are now not guilty before God. So having done that, he then circles back to his two issues. The first one he deals with is the second one that, uh, that he named um, in chapter 3, and that is the question, does understanding of justification by faith, apart from works, lead to sinning as much as you want? And his answer is, of course, a resounding no. Because we not only have been declared not guilty, we have also died to who we were and risen again in Christ. We have been given a clean record. We have also been given a new heart. We have been given the Holy Spirit. And so he goes through this glorious exposition in Romans 8, verses 31 to 39, of, of the life in the Spirit and the consequences of it in our lives. And that then brings us to where we are in this, in this verse right here. So we've come through an understanding of the gospel. The problem is human sinfulness. The solution is the imputed righteousness of Christ who died in our place to bear on himself the wrath that our sins deserve, a righteousness that we receive by faith alone and apart from anything that we do. This should lead to a life in which we now are new creatures in Christ and hate sin and are involved through the Spirit in putting sin to death in our lives. But then he asks, okay, I've been rooting this whole thing in talking about Israel. I've been talking about the people of God through the, through the Jewish scriptures. So what about them? What happened with them? If the gospel is rooted in the promises of God to his people in the Old Testament, if God is demonstrating, in fact, his faithfulness through that gospel, why is it that Gentiles are responding and Jews, by and large, aren't? And he's going to spend the next three chapters exploring this issue. His answer will be rooted ultimately in the sovereign purposes of God and in the mystery of election. I mean, if you understand what he wrote in chapter 3, you're actually quite relieved that it's entirely based on the sovereign work of God because if it were left up to us, none of us would be saved. If I, by my free will, had to choose God, I would choose what my will by nature is inclined toward, which is rebellion against God and walking away from him. And it is only because God, praise his name, did not leave me to make a choice on my own, but sovereignly intervened in my life that I am saved. But he's starting here first by giving just his whole heart in this matter. Now, he demonstrates all the reasons why you'd think it turned out exactly the opposite, but that, that only serves to underscore why this is such a matter of grief to him. Because what he begins here is saying, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. That's his response to the lostness of his own people. 
And he makes it clear he's not faking it. This is not a show. This is not putting it on just, just for, for dramatics. Uh, some might think that he was lying. I mean, because he was the, the apostle to the Gentiles, there apparently were some who thought that he was anti-Jewish. But he's saying, my conscience is clear. There's no display of grief for show here. He loves his own people so much that he would be willing to be damned if it meant they would be saved. Now, he says, if it were possible, the fact is it's not possible. Um, his damnation would not accomplish the salvation of anyone. Plus, I mean, his salvation is based on the, the, the sovereign will of God, not on anything he might choose to do. So this, this is a, a hypothetical statement he's making. He's just showing how passionate he is about this. And remember that this is a man who clearly taught the sovereignty of God in salvation. This is someone who fully affirmed the justice of God in condemning those, anyone, who was in sin. And yet, he grieves deeply that the Jewish people are lost. He knows they deserve that judgment, but it, it gives him unceasing anguish. Not just every now and then momentary grief, but this is an ongoing attitude. Now, this is in the middle of joy that he expresses elsewhere in his writings. Joy over the gospel, joy over his own salvation, joy over the faith and faithfulness of others, just to name a few things that he himself mentions as sources of joy. He finds the lostness of his own people, even in the middle of the joy of the gospel, to be an unending source of grief. Now he explains that part of that is simply because they are his kinsmen according to the flesh. Uh, when he talks about them being his brothers, it actually just means his, his born togethers, his siblings in this sense, not the word that he normally would use to talk about a brother or sister in Christ. But still, there's a natural tie. There's a particular connection with the Jews. He himself is one, and that is one of the reasons why it grieves him. These are people that he's connected to and cares about. And to be connected to someone and to care about them means that you care most about their relationship with God or lack thereof. That the most important thing about somebody is not their career and not their bank account. It's whether or not they are alienated from God or reconciled to him. And, and keep in mind, it, as he's saying this, as I mentioned earlier, these are the ones who caused him the most grief. As you read through the book of Acts, uh, Luke is pretty careful to make the point that almost always it's the Jews that stirred up the trouble against Paul. It's his own relatives, his own family, as it were, that, that even would stir up the Gentiles to oppose him. And the times when he is stoned, for example, it's Jewish people who are inciting the crowd to do that. See, those who rejected his Messiah also rejected him. Yet he loved them. And it grieved him especially that they, of all people, were lost. So he goes on to mention some other reasons why this is the strangest thing imaginable. It's like if, if you were looking at things right before Jesus was born, and you were told that the gospel was about to go out into the world, your assumption would be, well, the first folks who will eagerly grab this up are obviously the Jews. Clearly. I mean, God's been preparing them for thousands of years for this to happen. I mean, notice the list of advantages they enjoy. They're Israelites. They are the old covenant people of God. They are the chosen race. He says, to them belong the adoption. Now, Israel was God's son. I don't know if you realize this, but this is a major theme in Scripture, uh, that Adam was God's son, intended to reflect and represent God on earth. He failed. Then God called Israel to be his son, and that son also failed him and rejected him. And yet still there was this, this amazing relationship of adoption that God extended to a stiff-necked and rebellious people called Israel. Israel collectively was God's son. Individually, they were called his sons and daughters. He adopted them not simply as his slaves, but as his sons. One of the, uh, I've spent most of my adult life working in the Muslim world, and the highest a Muslim can attain is Abdullah, which means the slave of God. But the God of the Bible doesn't just have slaves. The God of the Bible has sons and daughters. And he had brought the Israelites in as that. They had the most intimate possible relationship with the living God, even if they were, in essence, almost all of them prodigals. 
to them belongs the glory. Remember the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle in the middle of the camp? Remember God manifesting his presence in such a way they couldn't even go in the tent? Remember the fact that God dwelt in the midst of his people all the way through their journey, and that was what gave them identity and meaning as a people? Remember that the glory was, in fact, a two-edged sword. Um, God being in their midst meant that his glory would often break out against them when they rebelled against him. But at the same time, although it was dangerous, it was also awesome. It was the glory that would later fill the Holy of Holies in Solomon's temple. It was a unique privilege granted to no other nation, the very presence of God with them. And they had observed over and over again that you can't dwell in the presence of the glory of God and exist in rebellion against that God. So to them belong the glory, to them belong the covenants. The God's covenant with Abraham, that through him all the peoples of the earth would be blessed. God's covenant with Moses, taking them as his people. God's covenant with David, promising that David would have a son to sit on, on the throne forever. These are agreements which God unilaterally gave to his people, and yet in which God bound himself in astonishing grace to keep promises to them. To them belonged those covenants, the very covenants that promised the salvation of all the peoples of the earth. To them belonged the giving of the law. And the law of God was an astonishing gift. Yes, it brought condemnation for those who broke it. At the same time, Paul, in the course of this letter, has made clear the law of God is the embodiment of knowledge and truth. The law is holy, and the command is holy and righteous and good, just to quote Romans 2.20 and Romans 7.21. See, the law of God was not something that God made up one night because he was in a bad mood and wanted to make people's lives miserable. So he thought, I'll just take all their fun away. I'll give them this list of rules they've got to keep. No, that's not the law of God. The law of God is the perfect revelation of the character of God and his will for his creatures to live in conformity to his image. By keeping the law, you are like God, which is what you were made to be. You were made to reflect his image. So the law of God is gloriously good. It's the display of God's glory. And so as we read through scripture, we find, in fact, the law is used three different ways. The first and foremost is to show us the character and the will of God. Paul tells us it also then serves to show us the dirt on our own faces. It's like a mirror we hold, God holds in front of us. So it becomes a mirror and a tutor to lead us to Christ. But the third use of the law that we often miss is that it's a guide to our growth in Christ-likeness in his image. Because you want to know what you're supposed to, to live like as someone who is being made more and more like Jesus? Read the law. The law is simply the description of who God is. Jesus is the perfect image of the invisible God, and we are now being conformed to his image as his disciples. So the law is a glorious thing. And even though the law proved in the end simply to be a stumbling block for, for the Jews, they had a revelation of God that no one else in the world had. To them belonged the worship. Now in Paul's day, the temple still stood. You remember the first temple was destroyed. It was rebuilt in sort of a, a smaller form uh, after the children of Israel returned from exile. Herod had rebuilt it massively. He had just done this glorious renovation job. It was as impressive as it had ever looked. And the worship was going on. The temple ritual was celebrated every day. And this is not just sacrifices, but also prayers and songs. All of it was designed to display the glory of God. It was all also designed to teach the holiness of God. The very point of the sacrifices was that the wage of sin is death. The worship pointed actually to Jesus. All of that was going on in the temple was designed to point to the true temple, the true presence of God in the midst of his people, which is Emmanuel, God with us. And so the temple itself and its worship all should have pointed everyone involved in it to the Lord Jesus. Ah, this is what all of this was leading to all this time. No, nope. to them belong the promises. God had made many incredible promises to his people. The promise to dwell in their midst and be their God. The promise to bless them with abundance when they walked with him. That promise of a king to sit on David's throne forever. And the promise of the day of the Lord, 
The day was coming that would be the day of Messiah, when God himself would step onto the scene of human history and make things right. That would also be the day of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the day of the ingathering of the nations. That was the most glorious promise of all. And it was a promise that was accompanied by the promise that he would take away their sin forever. And Israel knew those promises. They belonged to them. To them belonged the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Judah, Levi, and Benjamin, who were the physical ancestors of almost everybody who was presently then a Jew, subsequent figures like Moses and Aaron, Joshua and Caleb, David, the prophets. Their race was full of men and women of faith. And from their race came the Messiah, who is God over all. This was the culmination of all the things he said up to this point. And it's from their race. Note the clear statement of the deity of Christ. The Messiah is God over all. Jesus was God himself in human flesh. And that flesh was Jewish. That flesh was their people. The entire salvation of the world came through the Jewish race. It was not possible for any people on earth to have more advantages. And yet none of those advantages were sufficient to save them. Well, why? Well, Paul's already made it clear. You cannot inherit salvation and you cannot earn it. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And that grace is sovereign. Apart from that, no one will be saved. But you remember the sweeping indictment of chapter 3. No one understands. No one seeks for God. No one even wants to understand or seek for God until God intervenes in their lives. Only God acting in sovereign grace can save an unwilling sinner. And all sinners, by nature, are unwilling. Now, Paul will go on to unpack the mystery of election in the next, next three, three chapters. Nothing else could explain what has happened to God's chosen race. And he's also going to make it plain that not all the physical descendants of Jacob are true Israel. But for the moment, however, what we see in this text before us is that Israel did not welcome her Messiah. Gentiles are proving more receptive to the Jewish gospel than Jews are. And all the advantages in the world didn't overcome that spiritual deadness. That gives Paul enormous grief. Because the alienation of people from God, the condemnation of people to the eternal hell that we all deserve, grieved him deeply. So what does this mean for us? Well, first, we should have the same attitude that Paul has when it comes to lostness. It should cause us sorrow and anguish. Just too often, we don't have that attitude. I, I've thought of several reasons why. I think sometimes it's because we just don't take sin that seriously. I mean, after all, the world around us does not take sin seriously. In fact, the world around us celebrates it. And we can be unconsciously influenced by that. That's the world twisting our minds to think things that are contrary to the truth as it is found in the mind of God. And our own flesh and the devil are all too happy to join in the deception. Just to think, well, it's not that bad. It may be that we don't really believe what the Bible says about unbelievers. That they are not just in a little bit of trouble, but dead in their trespasses and sins. Justly under God's wrath and headed to an eternal condemnation at hell. Hell is a very unpopular subject and it may be that we simply don't take it seriously. I mean, the world jokes about hell. It will be no joke there. And perhaps we think there is some plan B. Uh, surveys have shown that the average American Christian is actually either a universalist or an inclusivist. That means they either believe everyone's going to be saved or they believe there is some way for everybody to be saved, whether they're a Christian or not, whether they come to faith or not. That there's some kind of plan B, whether that is God just accepts um, the, uh, your faithful performance of some religion as being uh, service given to him or whether that means some sort of post-mortem offer of the gospel. People go through lots of sort of mental gymnastics to try and come up with some way where everybody's really going to be okay and if they're not it's because they themselves have willfully chosen to reject the gospel. 
Well, the fact of the matter is everyone does willfully reject the gospel unless they hear it and the Spirit of God gives them faith. I think a lot of it's because we just don't want to think about it. It's easier not to think about it. The thoughts are painful. The thought that the non-believers around you and around the world are destined for an eternity under the wrath of God. That's, that's hard. And those thoughts demand action, and we don't want to act. We certainly don't want the kind of sorrow and anguish that Paul had. However, we have to think about it if we're to look at the world through God's eyes. If we are to love our neighbors as ourselves, it has to bother us, and it has to lead us and motivate us to action. It has to motivate us to action locally. Uh, if you are not sharing the gospel with the people around you who don't know Jesus, that means you either say you think God is a liar or you don't love him. One of those two. Those are the only options. You either think that what the Bible says about their eternal condition is not true, or you're happy and content for them to go to hell. Now, you don't save anybody by sharing the gospel with them. God does, but God has ordained that the preaching of the gospel is the means he uses to draw sinners to himself. And that is our obligation. And locally, right where you are, even here in the heart of the Bible Belt, you're surrounded by lost people. And there should be no lost person certainly in this county who hasn't heard the gospel with all the Christians that at least purport to be here. But this also needs to motivate us to action globally. I, I can't look at a text like this and not see missions. And you were expecting it. Um, just to give you some perspective, the year that I was born, which is 1957, there were 2.9 billion people on earth. Today, there are 8 billion people on earth, of whom over 4 billion live among peoples who have absolutely no witness to the gospel. Now, if the proclamation of the gospel is the only way that someone can be saved from the wrath of God, then that means that there are significantly more people alive today who have no access to the good news than even lived on this planet a mere 65, 66 years ago. The extent of lostness is vast. And we happen to live in the most evangelized part of the world, right here. Um, my former work, uh, when I was still on the field, which I would dearly love to go back to, um, I was at one point responsible for all of Central Asia, which is about 380 million people. Um, of that 380 million, 0.025% know Jesus. There are over 400 people groups in that area. We now have the whole Bible in six of them, in six of those languages. And the most evangelized people group in Central Asia is one-tenth of one percent Christian. I'm just trying to give you a sense of the lostness that exists in the world. And if we shared the passion of Paul, his grief over people's alienation from God, then that should impel us to action, to take the good news where it has never been before. And so with Paul, the realities of the gospel should impel us into local evangelism and global missions. Now, the second thing to keep in mind here is that there are no advantages, no advantages of upbringing are gonna save you. And I think this is particularly relevant for this part, this part of the country. I grew up in the Bible Belt. I actually grew up in um, just next door in Georgia in the 50s and 60s. Uh, when I was a kid, we were still praying and reading the Bible in public school. Um, I honestly thought that there were two kinds of people religiously in the world, Baptists and Methodists. Um, they had shorter sermons, so they got to the cafeteria first. Um, everyone went to church. And my own salvation story came because... As a, as, as a elementary school student, I was an avid reader. I found a book on the world's great religions, read it, went to my mom in distress and said, Mom, there are non-believers in the world. And she said, you're right, and you're one of them, which is exactly what I needed to hear, because I was. 
Because growing up in a Christian home, growing up in church, hearing the Bible my whole life, none of those advantages saved me. Just as with the Jews, who had every advantage, but apart from repentance and faith in Jesus, they were, they were cut off from God. The same thing is true of everyone around you here. So you live in a place that is still religion-saturated, especially compared to the rest of the nation. Church membership is common here. Lots of people come from Christian homes. Lots of people have been raised in church. I would even go so far as to say that a large number of people probably in this county experience what I call the Baptist Bar Mitzvah, where at a certain point in your childhood, you are to walk the aisle around the third go, go around through just as I am. Uh, you walk the aisle, you shake the preacher's hand, you get dunked, you're sure of your salvation, and you go on your merry way just as lost as you were when you started, but having been told that you now are eternally secure. And that sort of thing is commonplace in the Bible Belt. But none of that will save you. And so I'd simply like to remind you again of the gospel we've already gone through. That God not only exists, but he is the sovereign king to whom all of us must give account. And he is a holy God who will not tolerate any form of evil or wickedness or rebellion or even indifference toward him. All of us, every single one of us, are born rebels against God. And every one of us deserves condemnation, eternal separation from God in hell under his wrath. But in astonishing mercy, God looked at us and gave us the opposite of what we deserved. He became a man in the person of Jesus who lived the life we should have lived, died the death we deserve to die, rose again from the dead, victorious over sin and death and hell, and now graciously has commanded that everyone everywhere repent and put their trust in him. And all who do are reconciled to him, their sins are forgiven, um, and they are guaranteed eternity in glory with him. And if there's anyone in this room who has not done that, please don't think that any of the advantages you've had from your entire life will, will save you. Only repentance and faith in Jesus will do so. But that also means that that's the message that this passage impels us to want to get to the world. And so the challenges from this passage, I think, are, are very simple. First of all, if you are not walking as a disciple of Jesus, repent and believe the gospel. But for all of those of, of those of us in this room who are, please examine your heart and ask yourself, do you actually love your neighbor as yourself? Do you care? Does it give you grief and agony in your heart that those around you are perishing? And not only those around you here, but will you lift up your eyes to the nations and see the need that exists literally all around the world? Um, one of the things that stuck with me in the... Uh, the church service where God uh, impressed on me that I was to go into missions was this, this very simple illustration. Uh, I think these statistics are still true. About 90% of all the Christian, full-time Christian workers in the world are in North America, and they are ministering to the most evangelized 7% of the world's population. So if you see 10 people carrying a telephone pole, and nine are at one end and one's at the other, which end do you go to to help? And so the challenge very simply is this. Don't ask yourself, am I called to share the gospel? The answer to that is, if you have been called to Christ, you're called to his service, and you're called to be his witness, pure and simple. You're called to be an evangelist. And since we are all called to his service, rather than saying, I will stay where it is most comfortable unless God literally beats me over the head to send me somewhere else. Since you belong to Jesus, and since the purpose of your existence is to serve Jesus, in fact, the very purpose of your life is to glorify him, then where can I serve him best and intentionally head to where the need is greatest unless he directs you otherwise? Let's pray.